It was Christmas Day in 1996. The Ramsey family had just spent a fun-filled evening celebrating the holiday at the home of Fleet and Priscilla White. The family returned home around 10 o'clock p.m. when Jean Benet was put to bed. Her parents claim that that is the last time they saw her alive. The Boulder Police Department has interviewed more than 1,000 people in connection with the crime. However, the case remains unsolved to this day. My name is Ashton, and welcome to The Haunted Corner. Jean Benet Ramsey was born on August 6, 1990, in Atlanta, Georgia. She was the youngest of two children born to John and Patsy Ramsey. Jean Benet also had an older brother named Burke, who was three years older than she was. Little background on the parents John Ramsey was born in Nebraska in 1943. In 1966, he joined the Navy as a Civil Engineer Corps officer. He met his first wife, Lucinda, while they were undergrads at Michigan State University. The two eventually married and welcomed three children before the marriage ended. And in 1992, one of John's daughters from his first marriage, named Elizabeth, was tragically killed in a car accident. Patsy was born in 1956 in West Virginia. She was an American beauty pageant winner, having won Miss West Virginia in 1977 at 20 years old. Patsy graduated from West Virginia University in 1978 with a BA in journalism. Two years later, she married John and the couple welcomed their son Burke in 1987 and their daughter Jean Benet in 1990. Shortly after the birth of Jean Benet, the family moved to Boulder, Colorado into a 6,800 square foot home. John worked as the president of a computer software company called Access Graphics at the time. The family owned two private jets, a yacht, and a holiday home in Michigan, and their net worth in 1999 was reported to be $6.4 million. Following her mother's training and influence, Jean Benet began to compete in children's beauty contests at an early age. She would go on to win several titles, including the Colorado State All-Star Kids Pageant, Little Miss Charlevoix, America's Royal Tiny Miss, Miss Colorado Sunburst, and Colorado's Little Miss Christmas. On December 26, 1996, the family was planning on catching an early flight to Michigan, which is where their vacation home was. Patsy awoke around 5.30 a.m. to prepare breakfast for the family, and as she made her way to the kitchen, she discovered a note on the back staircase addressed to John, which outlined the details of a ransom demanding $118,000 for the safe return of their daughter, Jean Benet. Now keep the amount of this ransom in the back of your mind because it will come back later. It is a very specific amount. The note would also go on to encourage the Ramseys not to call the police. And it stated that the kidnappers would be in contact between 8 and 10 a.m. that day with the next steps. Patsy immediately ran to Jean Benet's room, threw open the door, and quickly noticed that, that Jean Benet was indeed missing. Around 5.52 a.m., Patsy called 911 and was quickly put into contact with one of the dispatchers named Kimberly Archuleta. The call itself is so heartbreaking to listen to. Patsy is hysterical and she states, we have a kidnapping, and then she begs the dispatcher to send the police and to hurry. Police were dispatched to the home and it's mentioned that when Patsy went to hang up the call, she didn't actually hang up and the line remained connected while the dispatcher, Kimberly, continued to listen. At that point, Kimberly states that she could hear faint voices and it sounded like there was more than one person in the room whispering. She believed that she heard what sounded like a voice saying, quote, we called the police, now what, end quote. She also believed that there were three voices in the room, like I mentioned. 
that was the last call of her shift that night. And she just didn't feel right about the call. She wanted to give her testimony, but she was told that there was a gag order and she should not talk about the case until it went to court. In 1997, the 911 call was eventually sent to the U.S. Secret Service and then on to the FBI for audio enhancements, but they were unable to decipher any other voices. Eventually, the tape was sent to the Aerospace Corporation for enhancement and review by experts. They were able to enhance the tape so much that they claimed that they could hear words being said. And they also claimed that there were three separate voices. And it's said that there is a deeper voice saying, quote, we're not speaking to you, end quote. A female voice thought to be Patsy saying, help me, Jesus. And then a third voice saying, well, what did you find or what did you do? Now back to the ransom note, it was two and a half pages long. And this is what it said. Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We do respect your business, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed, and if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills, and the remaining $18,000 will be in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on the delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an earlier delivery pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices, and if any are found, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good Southern common sense of yours. It is up to you now, John. Victory. S-B-T-C. The ransom of $118,000 is the same amount of a Christmas bonus that John had received from his job that year. Eventually, the handwriting from the ransom note was compared to both John and Patsy's handwriting samples, and John was pretty quickly ruled out. It is noted, however, that Pans Patsy's handwriting had over 200 similarities with the ransom note. The note was written on a notepad that was found in the home, and there were also two practice notes found in the home as well. I did watch a documentary where they practice writing out the note in its entirely, and it said that it took over 21 minutes to write it out. So whoever wrote the ransom note was in the house at the time writing the note, so they were in there for quite a while. Eventually, a federal court ruled it highly unlikely that Patsy had wrote the note, citing six handwriting experts. 
Within three minutes of the 911 call, two officers responded to the scene, including Officer Rick French. Patsy told Officer French that she had gone to Jean Benet's bedroom and saw that she was not in her bed and then went downstairs and found the ransom note, which is not what she had initially said. Initially, she said that she went downstairs, found the ransom note on the back staircase, and then went to Jean Benet's room and found that she was missing. So there's definitely a lot of conflicting statements that have been made. Officers then searched the home and there appeared to be no signs of forced entry into the home and nothing seemed to be out of place. Officer Rick French searched the basement before coming across a door that had a wooden latch on it. He claims that he never opened the door um, and he went back upstairs. Now, if there is a missing child, why would you not search every single nook and cranny of that house? He eventually would go on to say that since it was a kidnapping, they didn't think that she was in the house. Okay, I, I guess I understand that, but isn't it your job to figure out if she is in the house? Wouldn't that be your first step? Now, this was the only murder in that area of Boulder, Colorado that year. So the police department was just not prepared to handle the situation at all. Only Jean Benet's bedroom was blocked off from entry to prevent further contamination. The rest of the house was left open. And there was a lot of contamination of the scene. And we'll get to it. After Patsy contacted the police, she called their friends, Fleet and Priscilla White, who also rushed over to the house, and they arrived shortly after the police arrived. According to the parents, Burke never woke up during the kidnapping event, and he had to be woken up later in the morning, which raises questions for me about why weren't they thinking about Burke's safety during this time? If they knew that their daughter had been kidnapped, wouldn't you want to make sure that your son was in a safe place as well? Wouldn't you want him right by your side, not out of your sight? Eventually, Fleet would take Burke over to his house to get him away from the scene. And then he returned to the scene after that. So at that time, we had the Ramseys, the Whites, the police at the scene. And there is no attempt made to secure the crime scene. Police and friends and family are casually walking through the home picking up items, and potentially destroying so much evidence. Even Priscilla began cleaning the kitchen, which is like, okay, I know that you're trying to help, but put down the sponge. This is a crime scene. What are you doing? Linda Arndt was the first detective to arrive on scene around 8 o'clock a.m. At that time, they were waiting for the call from the kidnappers. The phones were tapped, and the 8 and but the 8 to 10 a.m. deadline came and went, and no one blinked an eye or even noticed that the deadline had passed. Around 1 o'clock p.m., Detective Arndt suggested that John search the house in order to occupy him. Almost immediately, John and Fleet headed to the basement to search, and that is where they would eventually find Jean Benet's lifeless body behind a closed door in the wine cellar of the basement the same door that Officer French did not look behind in the morning. Eventually, Fleet would go on to claim that when they got to the basement and they were looking for Jean Benet, they came to the door of the wine cellar. The door was open at that time. And he claims that he heard John scream, oh my God, prior to him turning on the lights in the wine cellar which raised questions of how John would have been able to see her body before the lights were turned on. Jean Benet was found with a white blanket over her. Her wrists were tied with a nylon cord. There was duct tape over her mouth. She had been strangled with a garrote made from a broken paintbrush and a rope. Um, the broken paintbrush handle was found in the basement as well, and it came from Patsy's paint set that was located in the basement. Jean Benet was wearing white long John style leggings and the white long sleeve shirt with a silver star on it. Immediately, Fleet ran upstairs screaming for someone to call 911. John took the duct tape off of her mouth, untied her hands, and brought her upstairs. Fleet would go back downstairs to collect the base, uh, the blanket, 
blanket, the duct tape, and the ropes before bringing them upstairs to the police, which, again, is like, I know you're trying to help, but could you not touch all the evidence? There's just so much wrong with the way this case was handled all around. Now, John would bring Jean Benet upstairs, placed her on the ground. Everyone was hysterical. Patsy brought her... Um, Patsy came in and she collapsed on top of Jean Benet's body and just sobbed hysterically. Detective Arndt then picked up Jean Benet and placed her next to the Christmas tree, which I don't understand. Um, she was then covered with a blanket and a Colorado Avalanche jersey. They were just destroying evidence from the start. So much evidence was destroyed. Later on, John Ramsey was overheard by detectives booking a private plane to Atlanta for Patsy, Burke, and himself. He then had to be informed by police that he couldn't leave the state, to which he responded, quote, I have a meeting that I cannot miss, end quote. Patsy and John provided hair and blood samples to the police and both the parents as well as Burke were interviewed. The autopsy was performed the next day. The time of death was estimated to be between 10 o'clock p.m. on the 25th and 6 o'clock a.m. on the 26th. The cause of death was listed as asphyxia by strangulation associated with craniocerebral trauma. There was not conclusive evidence of a rape, but droplets of blood were found in her underwear. Jean Benet had marks on her face and her back that could have been made with a stun gun. The cord on her wrist was not tied particularly tight, but the cord around her neck was very, very tight, and she was alive when the cord was placed on her neck. It was found. There was DNA found on her underwear as well as on the waistband of her pants. That DNA did not match anyone in the Ramsey family. There was a high, also a high-tech brand boot print found next to her body in the wine cellar. And there was also a partial palm print on the door frame that was leading to the wine cellar. Both the palm print and the boots did not match anyone in the family either. The family traveled to Georgia after the autopsy and refused to speak to the police. They hired a team of lawyers as well as a press team. Jean Benet was buried on December 31st, 1996 in Georgia. The very next day, the parents went on CNN to speak to the public, claiming that there was a killer on the loose. Patsy is heard saying, quote, keep your babies close to you. There's someone out there. End quote. The mayor of Boulder, Leslie Durgan, went on to deny that there was any danger to the public and that that was an isolated case. Fleet White eventually wrote a 14-page open letter to the press in which he specifically took aim at the Ramseys. He said, quote, the people of Colorado are entitled to be frustrated and angry with those public officials and other persons who have brought this case to its current status. We must be mindful, however, of the first cause of the investigation's failure. The refusal of John and Patsy Ramsey to cooperate fully and genuinely with those officially charged with the responsibility of investigating the death of their daughter, Jean Bonnet, end quote. Now we're gonna get into some of the theories. The most widely disputed theory of them all is that there was an accident with the brother Burke and something happened in which he hurt John Bonet and then the parents covered it up for him. That's the theory. Now Burke was having some issues at nine years old. His sister was getting most of the attention and he had to fight for attention in some pretty unconventional ways. He was acting out by smearing feces on items in the house, including Jean Benet's Christmas presents. So clearly, he wasn't doing great. Um, and he also had accidentally hit her in the face with a golf club, which had caused a scar under her eye. And Patsy even looked into plastic surgery for Jean Benet because of it. 
Now, along with this theory, there are two specific pieces of evidence that are called into play to support this theory. One of them is the flashlight, and the other is the pineapple. The Ramses had a flashlight, a huge black flashlight that was normally kept in a kitchen drawer. But in one of the crime scenes, it was noticed that it was sitting on the counter. In the crime scene photos, there's also a bowl of pineapple with a spoon in it. And the bowl and spoon only had Burke and Patsy's fingerprints on it. But neither of them remember anyone eating pineapple that night when they got home or at the Christmas party. Nothing. No one could remember what happened with that. But... During the autopsy, it was noticed that there was fresh pineapple in Jean Benet's stomach, meaning that she had to have eaten it somewhere near the time of her death. So the theory is that maybe Burke was having a midnight snack and Jean Benet woke up and came downstairs, maybe took a bite of the pineapple. He got upset, hit her with the flashlight, and then that was that. Maybe the parents covered it up. That is the theory. Now, the CBS documentary called The Case of John Benet Ramsey leaned really heavily into the Burke theory, and he ended up filing a $750 million defamation lawsuit against CBS, as well as Dr. Werner Spitz, who was a forensic pathologist who was quoted on the series and who also repeated his accusation against Burke on a Detroit radio show. That lawsuit was eventually settled for an undisclosed amount. The next theory is the intruder theory. Lou Smith was a former homicide investigator for Colorado Springs Police Department. He was brought in a few months after the murder, and he firmly believed in the intruder theory. On the night Jean Benet was killed, there had been two windows that were left slightly open to allow for electrical cords for the outside Christmas lights to pass through. There was also a broken basement window, which John had admitted to breaking a few months prior when he was locked out of the house. There was also one unlocked door in the house, too. Smith believes that the high-tech boot print that was left in the wine cellar had to have come from someone outside of the house. He also noticed a suitcase near the window in the basement in the crime scene photos, and the theory that he came up with is that the intruder attempted to put the body in the suitcase, but was unable to get the suitcase out the window, which is when the intruder panicked and the murder occurred. There were several suspects outside of the Ramsey family who were looked into for the crime as well, one of them being Gary Oliva. Gary Oliva it was a convicted pedophile and child rapist who currently is serving time for his crimes. He was a known sex offender who was very familiar with the area, and he lived near the Ramsey home at the time of the murder. On the night of December 26th, Oliva called a friend of his, whose name was Michael Vale, crying and claimed that he had, quote, hurt a little girl, end quote. Vale immediately called the Boulder Police Department when he saw the headlines the next day regarding the murder, but he never heard back from investigators. Oliva also confessed in a letter written to Vale where he claims, quote, I never loved anyone like I did Jean Bonnet, and yet I let her slip and her head bashed in half, and I watched her die. Oliva was arrested in 2016 on another charge, and during that arrest, it was noted that he not only had a stun gun on him, but he also had a poem that was dedicated to Jean Bonnet Ramsey called An Ode to Jean Bonnet. He has since been ruled out as a suspect via DNA testing. The next suspect that we're going to talk about is Santa Bill. His name was Bill McReynolds. He was a good friend of the family. He had played Santa at the Ramsey's Christmas parties in years past. He was also very fond of Jean Benet, and she had given him a private tour of the house before Christmas. Also, a few months prior to Jean Benet's death, Bill had a major heart and lung surgery, so he would have been very fragile at the time of her death. Um, but during that surgery, Jean Benet had given him a little vial of glitter, which he took into surgery with him. And I just thought that was really sweet. 
He also had an alibi for the night of the murder. He was having dinner with family an hour away, and he and his wife were ultimately eliminated as suspects after providing DNA and handwriting samples. He passed away of a heart attack in 2002. The next suspect is the only person to publicly confess to Jean Benet's murder. This person was named John Mark Carr at the time. They have since gone on to transition to living as a woman and have changed their name to Alexis Reich. So I will be referring to them as Alexis and I will be using she, her pronouns from now on as well. So in 2006, Alexis reached out to a journalism professor at CU Boulder whose name was Michael Tracy. Michael Tracy had done a lot of research on the crime, and he was actually in the process of making a documentary about the case as well. Alexis referred to themselves as Daxis in the emails they sent, and they described how they had killed Jean Benet, but it had been accidental, and the Ramses had known all along that she had killed her. Alexis goes on to claim that they had a sexual relationship and that Jean Benet had died during a sexual encounter. Eventually, Alexis would go on to confess on the phone with Michael Tracy, and police were able to trace Alexis's location back to Bangkok, Thailand, where they were living after facing child pornography charges. She was then arrested and extradited back to the U.S., The DA proceeded with a DNA test comparing Alexis's DNA with the DNA that was found in Jean Benet's underwear from the night of the murder. On August 29, 2006, the DA at the time, Mary Lacey, held a press conference where it was revealed that the DNA did not match and the case would not be moving forward. There was no evidence connecting Alexis to the scene. The only thing that connected them was their own confession. So why would you confess to a crime that you did not commit? Alexis was eventually released from custody and the child pornography charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. And she fled the country again. The interview with this person is bizarre. Um, and if you are interested in checking that out, it there's a special, an ID special called Jean Benet, an American murder mystery that covers that interview. The next suspect is a man named Michael Helgoth. This is a bit of an interesting one. Michael was an electrician who also worked at a junkyard. He had apparently completed work at the Ramsey home in the past, and it's also mentioned that there was a possible property dispute with the Ramseys. John Kennedy is a man who owned the junkyard where Michael worked. He remembered that Michael had mentioned a job around Christmas where he claimed he and his friend would be making fifty to $60,000 each. However, in January, when John had asked Michael about the job and how it went, he said it didn't go through. Michael had a record of sexual assault on a minor after a girlfriend found him naked under the covers with her child. He also, at one point, had mentioned that he wanted to know what it would be like to, quote, crack a human skull, end quote. He also owned a pair of high-tech boots similar to the boot print found at the scene, and he also had a stun gun similar to the one used in the murder of Jean Benet. Now, two days after a press conference where the DA stated that they were closing in on the murderer, Michael Helgoth died by suicide. Now, there is an A&E special called Hunting Jean Benet's Killer, The Untold Story, in which there's a prisoner whose name is Bernice, and she claims to have information about a suspect whose name is Todd Foos. Now, Bernice is serving time for assaulting Todd Foos, so take this with a grain of salt. But Bernice claims that their daughter the daughter that she had with Todd Foos, her name was Cinnamon, was in pageants with Jean Benet, and that Todd Foos was once caught watching the girls in their changing rooms. Bernice also mentioned that Todd would brag about how easy it was to break into homes. 
So could Todd have been the partner that Michael was going to do the job with around Christmas? It's claimed that Todd did know Michael and they were associates, so it's definitely a possibility. But eventually the two were both ruled out via DNA testing. The Boulder PD and the Boulder DA had very differing opinions on who committed the crime. Boulder PD would not deviate from their belief that Patsy Ramsey was responsible for the death of Jean Benet, while the Boulder DA was looking heavily into the possibility that an intruder had committed the crime. By August of 1998, one of the five detectives that was leading the case, Steve Thomas, actually resigned from the Boulder PD because of the way the case had been handled. According to Thomas's resignation letter, there were many things that were being done that were raising red flags for him. Police reports, physical evidence, and investigative information were shared with the Ramsey's attorney. And during the investigation, evidence was brought to the DA's office only to have that evidence refused because it was, quote, insignificant, end quote. You know it's bad if people are resigning due to the way a case is being handled. According to Jean Benet, an American murder mystery, in 2008, there was a re-examination of the articles of clothing that Jean Benet was wearing using a new DNA technology called Touch DNA. This means that it's possible to get a DNA profile from items that a person has touched. When that technology was used on the long johns that Jean Benet was wearing, they were able to get a profile. The DNA results suggested that it could have come from the same individual that left DNA on Jean Benet's underwear. The DA, Mary Lacey, ultimately came to the conclusion that this DNA must be the killer's DNA and that it does not match anyone in the Ramsey family. After that discovery, Mary would go on to write an, a letter to the Ramseys saying that an unidentified male's DNA was found on the clothing as well as apologizing to the family for the scrutiny that they had been under. In 2013, news broke about something that had been hidden from the public previously. Contrary to what was released at the time, the grand jury had actually voted in 1999 to indict John and Patsy Ramsey on charges of abuse resulting in the death of a child and accessory to a crime. The indictment cited, quote, two counts of each of child abuse, and it said the parents did unlawfully, knowingly, recklessly, and feloniously permit a child to be unreasonably placed in a situation that posed a threat of injury to the child's life or health, which resulted in the death of Jean Benet Ramsey, a child under the age of 16, end quote. The DA at the time, Alex Hunter, had kept the charges secret and decided not to prosecute. So why did they ask the grand jury to vote on it to begin with? When the news of the hidden information breaks, people were confused and understandably so. According to Alex Hunter, he claims that there wasn't sufficient evidence to get a conviction. Some people believe that he wanted to protect the Ramseys in that case, though. Patsy Ramsey passed away on June 24, 2006, in Atlanta, Georgia, after battling ovarian cancer. She was buried next to her daughter, Jean Benet, and her stepdaughter, Elizabeth, and she passed away without knowing what happened to her daughter, and I honestly can't imagine anything worse. With that, I will leave you with a statement from the Boulder Police Department website. Quote, as of December 2021, the Boulder Police Department has processed more than 1,500 pieces of evidence related to the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey. Jean Benet was six years old when she was reported missing on December 26, 1996, after her family reported finding a ransom note inside their home in the 700 block of 15th Street. Her body was found in a basement room, and a later autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. As of December 2021, that evidence has included the analysis of nearly 1,000 DNA samples. 
the BPD Major Crimes Unit has received, reviewed, or investigated more than 21,016 tips, letters, and emails, and detectives have traveled to 19 states to interview or speak with more than 1,000 individuals in connection to the crime. Thanks to the huge advancements in DNA technology, multiple suspects have been run through the system to check for matches. CBI has updated over 750 reference samples with the latest DNA technology. The Boulder Police Department works closely with CBI on future DNA advancements. Additionally, police have worked with CBI to ensure the DNA in the system can be compared correctly to new DNA samples that have been uploaded to ensure accuracy. That DNA is checked regularly for any new matches. As the department continues to use new technology to enhance the investigation, it is actively reviewing de genetic DNA testing processes to see if those can be applied to this case moving forward. Anyone with information related to this investigation is asked to contact the Boulder Police tip, Department tip line at 303-441-1974, Boulder's Most Wanted at bouldercolorado.gov, or Northern Colorado Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477 or www.nococrimestoppers.com, end quote. And I really hope that one day we're able to learn what really happened that night. This is one of those cases that's really stuck with me. I grew up in Colorado. I've heard about this case since day one. I was really young when it happened, very, very close in age to Jean Benet. And I just want to know what happened. We have the technology available, so let's hope that one day it leads to an arrest. Thank you for tuning in to episode one of The Haunted Corner. The sources for today's episode will be listed in the show notes and also on the blog at www.thehauntedcorner.com. Check out episode two, available now wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For early access to next week's episodes, please visit patreon.com slash thehauntedcorner and join at the $5 per month level. You'll have access to upcoming episodes one week early, Patreon exclusive content, and an exclusive The Haunted Corner sticker and more. Follow us on social media at The Haunted Corner on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. And if you have a case suggestion or a correction to anything I've said, please send it to thehauntedcorner at gmail.com or submit it through the website. Until next time, be kind and take care of yourselves and others. Bye-bye.